Well, good evening, friends. Pastor Charles here. After some time away for the last couple of weeks, it's great to be back with you tonight. I want to share with you from Paul's introductory words from his letter to the church in Corinth. Some scholars have called this letter of Paul's the painful letter because Paul challenges the church in some significant ways because he loves them and cares about their community being transformed through renewal in Jesus. But before he launches into his difficult message, Paul has some words of encouragement for the church, and I want to read those to you this evening and talk about them for a few minutes. 1 Corinthians 1, beginning in chat, verse 1. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church that of, of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, Call to be saints together with all those who are in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Two things I want us to look at this evening. First, the faithfulness of God in Christ to call and love his people. And secondly, the faithfulness of God in Christ to change, to transform his people, to make the broken, the old, new, to make the dead alive. First point, God is faithful to, in, Christ, in Christ to call and love his people. God's faithful to his people whom he calls in Christ Jesus. Paul is reminding the church and us that we are united to Christ. We are in him. When God looks at you, he sees Christ. He sees Christ's perfect life instead of yours. He loves you as a son or a daughter. He delights in you. He calls you by name. We are reminded who we are, called, dearly loved, and whose we are, child of God. We are called and loved in Christ, and we are kept in Christ. Paul uses the word sustained. Till the end, never cast out. God continues to endure with us because he sees us in Christ. In Christ, we have God's ultimate word of approval. We belong to him not because of what we've done or be not because of what we've left undone, but because of what Christ has done. Horatius Bonner penned these words sung by the church as a hymn. He writes, Thy works, not mine, O Christ, speak gladness to this heart. They tell me all is done. They bid my fear depart. To whom save thee who canst alone for sin atone? Lord, shall I flee. This is an important reminder for us as individuals and as a church as we seek the transformation of our lives, our community, and the world through the renewing work of Jesus Christ for the glory of God. Theologian Cyrus Schofield told a story about his son's old dog. He said he hated that dog. One day his son was boarding a train to go back to college, and as he was getting on the train, he said to his dad, Dad, I forgot to make arrangements for caring for my dog. Would you take care of him? And then he jumped on the train and departed. Schofield said, I took care of that old yellow dog because he belonged to my son. Because I love my son, I had to take care of that dog. Friends, God takes care of us because he loves his son. Because in Christ, he loves us and takes care of us. Because God is faithful. We're free. We're free to own our brokenness and our sin. We're free to admit and own the brokenness of others, to take it to him, to seek real transformation, to push back against it, to put off the old man, to put on the new. And we have hope as we wait for him as Christ is committed to renewing us, our community, and world. God is faithful to call you and to love you 
And the second point is this, God is faithful in Christ to change, to transform his people, to make the broken, the old, new, to make the dead alive. Paul uses this declarative language. He says he has sanctified you. It means he's made you holy. It's sure and it's a certain declaration by Paul. Yet if we're honest with ourselves, we know that we nor the world are there yet. My old self, using Paul's language from his letter to the church in Colossae, is not all put off, nor is my new self all put on. In Christ, our faithful God is changing you, certainly making you holy as you have been declared to be. He's transforming you from the inside out. He's changing the way you think about yourself and others in the world. He's changing the way you speak about yourself and others in the world. He will sustain you to the end as you wait, all the way to the end, guiltless in Christ. This, too, is an important reminder for us as we are hearing currently on Sunday mornings about our call to be the empowered church. We are being nudged by God's Spirit towards transformation through renewal in Jesus, which entails us seeing how we fall short. So what's our response going to be? Paul wants the church, he wants us to go to Jesus, to repent of our sins and brokenness and believe in him, not just to be forgiven or to be saved from our sins, but as we are being saved, as we are being transformed, as we are dying to sin and living to righteousness, as we are becoming what we've been declared to be, sanctified, holy. Jesus is the one who did good works perfectly for us who do not. Jesus is the one who did not fall short of God's demands of holiness for us who do fall short. Pastor Stephen Um writes, in short, the basis for Paul's encouragement to the Corinthian church, to us, is that their past, present, and future have been confirmed, declared, secured, enriched, and sustained in Christ. So I want to encourage you to remember who you will be when Christ comes. He will renew you. He will complete his good work of transformation in you. Because God is faithful, you are free to push, free to own your brokenness, your sin, free to own the brokenness of others, free to take it to him, free to seek real transformation and push back against it, to put off that old man in you, to put on the new, and you have hope as you wait for him. Because Christ is committed to renewing you your community, and the world. As we can contemplate our necessary and certain transformation through renewal in Jesus, one thing we've already said is we're free. We're free to admit our brokenness to God and others. We're free to push back, to move forward in faith. And we don't have to be paralyzed because we're loved and secure in Christ. This not only affects the way we view ourselves and our own sin, but it also affects the way we view others and their sin. I have nothing in myself to bring to God but my sin and brokenness in need. My sin, though it may manifest itself different than yours, needs the work of Jesus just as much as yours does. We may not all sin. We do not all sin in the same ways. But we are all capable of all sin. And all sin deserves death. But the gift of God is eternal life for those in Christ. If we really live out of that, then we'll see our king's renewal of us in our community. When we think we've arrived or we don't need the righteousness of Christ, or maybe we're not as bad as some other person, when we look to ourselves or our giftedness or others for righteousness, it creates disharmony in our community. I read a story about an exceptional violinist. She was heads above the others in her section and able to pull off amazing technical feats. However, she became preoccupied with her gift and ignored her responsibility to accept the authority of the conductor, as well as the community of the orchestra. As a result, she ended up playing something that drew attention to herself, but was out of tune with the rest of the orchestra. She had this phenomenal gift in isolation, but her pride and her gift hindered her from using it properly. The end result of of leading with aptitude instead of identity was communal disharmony. 
We are challenged to view each other and deal with each other in the same way God views and deals with us. If the gospel is good news for you, it must be good news for others with whom you deal. This message about God's faithfulness affects the way we view others' differences. Our lives are a mess morally, and Jesus came to save messes like you and me. That knowledge should change. It should change our friendships, relationships with others who are different from us, whether it's political leanings or taste in music or food, different gifts or struggles with sin, different jobs and social circles, because the gospel brings us together. And we all want to see Christ's kingdom advance, and we're better together than apart. Pushing back against how we view others' differences with the faithfulness of God to sinners like us will change our church, and it will transform our community. One scholar said it this way, Paul is essentially saying, look, Corinthian church, look, Central Presbyterian church. You may be falling apart at the seams, but the God who called you has secured your past, present, and future. He's holding you together. What does this mean for us? He goes on to say it means that our status as sanctified and saints is not based upon our work, but upon the work of another. Our identity is sure because it was given to us by someone else. Our gifts are sure and sufficient because they were given to us by the gift maker. And our future is secure because it has been prepared for us by the one who holds the future in his hands. Because we live in a meritocracy, he writes, this sounds alien. The gospel is an anomaly in a culture that runs on self-definition, self-help, and self-realization. But for those who have reached the bitter end of identity building, competency maintenance, and future building. It is the greatest news imaginable. In the gospel, God declares us presentable before he ever even looks at our record. The gospel says, stop striving to build an identity. You have been given one free of charge because of the striving of another in your place. You no longer have to live in order to build an identity, but you can live into the identity that has been given to you. Because God is faithful, friends, you are free. We are free to own our brokenness, the brokenness of others, to take it to him, to seek real transformation, to push back against it, to put off the old man and to put on the new. And we have hope as we wait for him because Christ is committed to renewing us, our community, and world. Let me pray for us. Lord God, we thank you for your commitment to us in Christ to renew us. So Holy Spirit, with that knowledge, would you help us to seek the transformation of our lives and our community and the world? In Jesus Christ, and we pray in his name. Amen. Great to see you. Have a good evening, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.